Hey guys, Don Morris here, and in this video I'm going to be showing you how to assemble one of our seven-cylinder radial engines. This is the standard size 16 and a half inch in diameter engine, and laid out in front of you are all the pieces for the double size, or about 33 inch in diameter engine. If you look across here and count all these parts, you'll find there's somewhere over 450 parts laid out, and uh, that is a lot of parts. We've already spent some time organizing these parts and laying them out, and that's the first thing you should do when you open up your box. A lot of you will have gotten a box that looks a whole lot like this, and when you open it up, you'll see all of those parts. Those are pretty much the same parts that are laid out in front of me, and I'm going to be putting the extra large ones together, but what I say on that applies directly to this one as well, with only a few minor changes, and I'll highlight those when we get there. So when we're ready to get started, the first thing to do, after you've organized all the parts, sanded off any defects that you see, you'll find a few little things like this, where maybe the laser cutter didn't quite cut all the way, and we're gonna gently pop that little piece out. And uh, we'll find lots of little places like that, where we can clean things up and make everything look pretty. Um, depending on how much time you want to spend on this, you can sand all of your parts to make them pretty to get rid of all of the uh, after flash on all of the different pieces. Or you can just put it together the way it is, which is pretty much what I did on the prototype. I'm going to do a kind of in-between on this particular uh, model. In fact, what I'm going to do is put it together and at various parts I'm going to stop and I'm going to use oil-based stains on this to try and make it into an attractive uh, engine that would look appropriate in this particular building. Step one tells me that we're going to do pistons and rods. And across here it tells me what parts we're going to need to do the pistons and rods. In step one, we are going to need seven inner pistons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven inner pistons, 14 outer pistons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Thirteen of these uh, wrist and articulating pins, um, six articulating arms. We are going to need 12 of these rods, uh, um, articulating outer rods, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and one of these off-camera master, inner master rods, and two of these outer master rods. We'll take that one off-camera. So these are all the pieces we're going to need for this step. And the other thing we're going to want is we're going to want some locator pins. Now if you're working on a double size kit like I am, you're going to want quarter inch locator pins. If you're working on a single size kit, you're going to want eighth inch locator pins. And on the eighth inch pins, you'll have to cut those yourself. You'll have to cut the quarter inch ones yourself as well. But on the eighth inch pins, it doesn't take very much. I was going to bring an X-Acto knife, but I forgot. So I'm going to have to use my uh, Swiss Army knife. All I have to do to cut this is simply roll that knife around on the pin. Roll that knife around on the pin. Now it's scored and just click. There we are and we have a locator pin to whatever length it is that we need our locator pin. You'll want a lot of those locator pins. It really helps in doing a quality job of assembly. All right, so According to our directions, we should spread the glue, uh, we should start with the pistons, and we should spread the glue on the outside of the outer pistons. Now, when I look across here, I can see I've got a good quality side and a not so good quality side. And that not so good quality side is from the back of the laser. You just can't ever get it to come out quite perfect. So I'm gonna hide that by putting the glue on the side that doesn't look so good. Now, I'm just using Elmer's glue all. You can use pretty much any wood glue that you like. It doesn't take a lot of glue, and we're not talking high stress, so come on, there we go, to get this job done. There's a little glue on each of those sides, and now I'm gonna line up the piston. If you take a look, 
spread that glue side down, set that glue side down. Everything should line up exactly correctly. That's one piston done, and I need to do seven pistons. There we go. So we did that seven times, and now we have all seven of the pistons. The next thing we're supposed to do is assemble our master rod. And on our master rod, this gets a little bit more interesting because we want to make sure that we don't spread everything past the edge of here. We're going to set one rod down, face down in front of us, and then we are going to spread glue on the surface of the inner master rod. See if we can do that without making a mess. The glue goes just around the edge. Of the inner master rod. And then down between each of these joints across here. You don't want to put glue in areas where they would be exposed. Now this is going to get glued down across here. And in order to help us make sure that everything is lined up, this will not do the job entirely for us, but it will certainly help. We can use some of these locator pins that we were talking about. And those locator pins are not designed to become part of the final structure but they're designed to help us get everything lined up in the right location. And that looks pretty good to me. I'm going to pop these pins back out because it's a lot easier to insert them after I put this piece down. So now I'm going to put the glue across the top of the inner master rod. Once again, following the edges, but not across the very top here. And there is our inner master rod. We can actually stick glue down about there. And we are going to place this across. Now we want to make sure everything lines up. So we're going to pop our locator pins in. Several locator pins. And I'm actually going to go ahead and grab one of these little wrist pin uh, as well. And I'm going to pop him into position. There he is. And that is going to make sure that everything on here is located where it needs to be. I'm going to line everything up by hand as well as locate everything with the pins. And now I have that master rod assembled. There's got a little, I've got a little glue squeeze out in the bore, so I'm going to wipe that glue out with my fingers. That's one of the beauties of using glue all. You can do that without any problem. And at this point, I'm ready to set all of these aside to dry. I'm also ready to begin working on the articulating rods. So I'm going to put the master rod over here. I can pop these out just because it looks cooler that way. And I'm ready to do articulating rods. On our articulating rods, we need to do six of these articulating rods. And the six articulating rods are going to go together fairly similarly to what the master rod uh, went together. Two of the outside articulating rods will go on one of the inside articulating rod. Now unfortunately I wasn't able to get any locator pins into these so let me show you where they need to go. If you look right here when we slide it forward as soon as that gap is covered that is exactly where this goes. So make the least possible overlap there and you'll see that in the plans as well and that's where these are going to go. We're going to set our after flash side up because that's how we make sure we got the right thing. And we're going to go ahead and glue the backs. Once we've got glue spread on the backs, we're going to go ahead and place our articulating rod into position. Everything needs to line up, just barely overlapped across there, and this is a good spot to use our uh, little wrist pins again to help as alignment tools. Anything you can use 
Anything you can slip into place to keep anything lined up, that's going to be helpful. So here is one out of six of our articulating rods. With that one out of six of our articulating rods done, we just need to do the following five. Cha-ching! There we are, six of them done. And the next thing that we need to do is we need to put all of these together to form the rotating assembly. Now one of the things you'll notice is that these connecting rods or these um, wrist pins need to be exactly as wide as what these are. And they might be a little bit narrower, that's fine, but if they're a little extra wide, they're going to stick and this thing isn't going to be able to rotate very well. So you'll need to sand them off to whatever level that is. And I'm going to have to do a little sanding on this one. It's a little hard to see, but it's a little up. That one's a little up, that one's a little up, that one's a little up, that one's a little up. Um, by the way, yours may not have holes drilled in the centers. The holes are purely decorative. If you have a kit that doesn't have holes drilled in the center and you want holes, drill them. Go for it. Um, so here are all of our pieces. We are ready to assemble the rotating assembly. So remember I told you that these pins are just a little bit too long? I'm going to need to sand those pins off. And so I've got a little sandpaper and I'm just going to sand round and round until those pins are the right length. Now I don't want to do this on my final piece, so I've used some spare pieces to assemble a jig, and this will help me get everything to the right depth. I'm using an 80 grit sandpaper, and that makes pretty quick work of this. Now, if you aren't somebody who likes sanding by hand and you have a power sander, by all means, use the power sander. Nice and smooth on the front, nice and smooth on the back. We have a pin that is ready for use. Now, one of the other things that looks nice on these pins is if you bevel the edges a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and manually sand the edges just a little bit to make them look nice. Now, my pins are drilled, and if you've drilled your pins, you can do this as well. If you haven't, it's harder to do it. I've just stuck a dowel rod through that center, and now I can bevel that edge a little easier than I'd be able to bevel that edge if I hadn't sanded the pin, or drilled the pin. So that definitely isn't the most fun task, but I've got all of these pins, and I went ahead and did all the ones for future steps as well of the same size. I've got them all sanded off, and I've got them all beveled on the corners, and now when I put them in, you'll be able to see that there's no projecting edges on the sides. So there's nothing that's going to catch everything. And now I get to start looking at assembling my rotating assembly. And so each of these is gonna go in position. I'm gonna make sure I put my good faces forward. These are gonna pop into position. And each one of these is going to get a piston. And we're going to be able to glue this together. But before I go through the whole process, Come on now. There we are. Before I go through the whole process, I'm going to stop and I am going to stain my parts. Now, I don't recommend use, using paint, but you can use stains, and I have some wood stains. And I'm going to do a gray all over all of my rods. I'm going to do a lighter gray on my pistons, and I'm going to do sort of a black on my piston pins. And uh, we're going to stop to do that. That is strictly optional, as is the waxing, although the waxing uh, will make things roll a little easier. So here we are again, and uh, I have stained all of the pieces, and I'm ready to actually go ahead and do part 1D, assembling the rotating assembly. So we begin with the master rod. And each of these are going to fit inside the master rod, and they're going to be pinned with one of the pins. Now, before we do that, though, this is our chance to come back and to wax where everything is going to contact everything else. So I'm going to start by waxing around the edges of each of these pieces. 
right here in the socket area where it is going to move. I have a candle here. You can use a lot of different types of waxes. Even a crayon that's the right color would work really well um, to wax. Now that I've waxed all of the connecting rods, I need to go ahead and wax the corresponding area on the pistons. The waxing process is strictly optional, however it will help things to run a little bit more smoothly. I suppose we could also wax the insides of these, but in my experience they are not going to be a big problem. And now, it's re now we're ready to actually do our assembly. So we're going to slide that in, and we're going to pin it in place, and repeat. Master assembly. Across here we need to add our pistons. There we are, and the last thing I want to do is I want to put just a little bit of glue on each of these to ensure that it stays in position. So I'm just going to drop a little glue around the back of each one of these rods. And there it is, our completed master assembly. Step one done, set it off to the side, and we'll begin on step number two. So on step number two, we're going to need two of the crank throws, the outer crank throws, two of the inner crank throws, and three separate dowel rods, um, depending on whether it's a single or a double, depending on uh, which size it is, is going to be different, but we've got all the pieces necessary to begin assembling the crankshaft. Now, our instructions tell us to set this upside down. It's a little hard to tell what direction upside down is, but probably the easiest way to look at it is this thing is supposed to spin in a counterclockwise direction, so we're going to set it with the arrow facing in the clockwise direction. So here we are. Right now the arrow is facing in the clockwise direction. That's upside down. Um, we're going to go ahead and glue one of these across the back and at the same time we're going to assemble the other one. The other one is going to be set with its arrow facing the opposite direction and it is going to uh, move the opposite way so that we are going to be able to uh, have one go each direction. Um, they're going to sit on top of each other just like so. Each of these needs to be on the inside. Now, all we have to do is glue around the outside edges and place them into position, and we should be good. Carefully line everything up. There's one. There's the other. And our crank throws are complete. This is going to be the forward shaft, this is going to be the journal, and this is going to be the rearward shaft. Unfortunately, we can't really do too much with it except put the journal in place for right now. So I'm going to go ahead and get that journal, and I'm going to put the journal in. Now it doesn't matter which side I put the journal into to start with because either one is going to have the same journal on it. So I'm going to go ahead and put that into position. It's important that we get this journal glued very, very firmly into place. And we need to make sure that everything is straight up and down and true when we glue that journal into 
position. All right, so we're going to pull the glue into the, into the gap here by spinning this shaft. And as we do, we're going to tr pull the glue in. And at the end, we're going to start to see the glue come back all the way through in a nice even layer. And that tells us we're all the way around, and this thing is very, very firmly glued into position. There is our first piece. We're going to do the same thing for the back side here with this piece. And it's going to sit across like this. So once this journal is in, we're going to set the rear journal. And on the rear journal, we're going to turn this piece over and put it right here on the edge. This is going to give us something to support it while we put the rear journal into place. Um, now this time, we're going to put a little glue on to start with, pre-glue, and then we're going to kind of do the same thing we did before. This time I'm just kind of rubbing some glue into the bore to try and get everything as secure as possible. And I don't want glue oozing out anywhere, but I want to make sure that there's enough glue that everything is firm. I'm going into that same spot, and I'm just spinning glue down into that joint, just like it's liquid bearings. When I've got everything so that I'm happy with it, I've got my journal in place, I've got my rear piece in position, I am going to grab a little scrap of something. Um, and I'm going to make sure there's no extra glue on the outside edge because that would interfere with uh, action later on when this thing moves. So, so my front journal is aside and it is drying and I'm ready, or my rear journal, now I'm ready to go ahead and put the shaft on the front journal. And when I put the shaft on the front journal, notice that I've turned this over for the front shaft. The inner piece is down and now I'm ready to put that front journal in place. This is just the same process that we did before. We're going to spin the glue down into that gap. We're just going to keep spinning glue into there until the glue comes back out the other side of that gap. This needs to be very firmly glued into position. But I'm pretty happy with that. I've got glue all the way around and everything is in position. Everything is straight up and down and we are going to allow this sucker to dry before we try anything else. So I've got my front half journal and I've got my rear half journal. I think I did it a little backwards from what they did in the plans, but it doesn't matter which one has the throw on it and which one doesn't at this stage. We've got the two half journals put together and we're going to allow those to dry before we can put the rotating assembly together with the journal. And that's going to require some waxing and we're actually going to stop and um, we're going to stop and stain our assembly before we do that as well because this is the last chance we're going to have to stain it the colors we want to stain it. Okay, I stained the two halves of our crankshaft and now we're ready to go ahead and assemble the uh, crank over the top of the rotating assembly. So I'm going to reach over to where I had placed my rotating assembly and we are going to check the rotating assembly for fit. There's our rotating assembly sitting on top of the crankshaft and now we are going to need to glue the two halves of the crankshaft together. The important part is when we glue the two halves of this crankshaft together we have got to make sure that we don't glue it to the rotating assembly. It has to be free to rotate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-glue around the edge here. Just get a little glue up around that edge and then we're going to add that gently to the crankshaft. Sometimes I use strips of wax paper to kind of help this, but on this larger model I'm not sure how necessary that is. There is our pre-glued crankshaft, and I need to make sure that our two halves of our crankshaft exactly align with each other before we're done with this. Now another thing that can be very helpful when it comes to doing this 
is to get stacks of individual material to try and help hold the crank parallel. So I'm going to reach over here to my thing of spares and I'm going to grab one, two, three, four, five layers of something, really anything, and I'm going to stick that back behind the web here. And that's going to help to hold the web in its parallel position while everything dries. And that finishes up step number two on the crankshaft assembly. Now that we've completed step two, we're going to move on to step three and we're going to get rid of a lot of small parts. So you can see I've laid out my small parts and uh, we're going to begin with the timing reduction gear. So you can identify the timing reduction gear uh, in that the, the large timing reduction gear is solid with a tiny dot on it. And then we need the small timing reduction gear and it is the, the smallest gear that we have. You can also kind of set those down on top of the plans if you're using a original sized engine. Otherwise you'll have to be a little more careful about that. We are going to ensure that the little pointer at the top lines up with the dot at the top of the other gear. So, turning the gear over onto its back, a little ring of glue, not too much, we don't want extra glue squeezing out on this thing. Just a small ring of glue and we are going to align the pointer with the dot. To help us make sure that we have everything lined up right, I'm going to stick another dowel rod into there temporarily to get all my alignment perfect. Once my alignment is set up properly, I'm going to remove that because I don't want that to dry in place. And I had a little bit of glue squeeze out going on there. So here is uh, step A, I've made my timing reduction gear. In our next step, we're going to be building the rocker arms. And those rocker arms are going to go each on one of these shafts. Once they're positioned on the shafts, the shafts are going to get little stop blocks. And they are then going to fit inside each one one of these holders. And that is going to control the motion of the valves when that's done. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put together the rest of these rocker arms. I am going to need 14 total of these rocker arms and that's going to take me a little while. They're pretty simple to assemble. The inner rocker arm two outer rocker arms, a little glue on the outer rocker arm. Note that the two outers are set in opposite directions, so one side goes on one side, the other goes on the other. And my rocker arm is glued in position. And that is the last of my rocker arms. Um, once I'm done with my rocker arms, I'm going to need to add the two little spacers to each side of the rocker arm. And the way to add the two little spacers to this, each side of the rocker arm is to know what width it's going to be. Now I've pre-assembled one of these to act as a guide for my width. And I'm just simply going to put a little drop of glue on here, put a little drop of glue on here, Place that in position, place this one in position, and then I'm going to put it on the holder and 
push it in until everything matches. Now I know that it's centered up properly and it's going to fit where that goes. So here's where our final holder pieces go, right on each side, and that is going to be my completed rocker arm assembly. I need to do that again, again, again. And there it is, the last one. Our next step is going to involve assembling one of these, and we're just simply going to glue one of these on each side. There's our last holder begun, as in step 1A over on our paper, and the next thing we are going to do is pause, not for station identification, but for stain deposition. we got to stain all of these pieces before we start assembling them, or we'll never be able to get the proper colors of stain onto them. So the staining is done, and it's time for us to finish up assembling our valve rocker arms. Uh, now, when I stain these, I left the spot, hopefully you can see it here, where it is not yet stained so that the, uh, wood, uh, the glue would stick to it better. And now all I've got to do is finish gluing all these together. But before I glue it together, I need to place the rocker arm inside the holder the way that it's going to go. Okay, with the little end with the hole facing out and the contact end facing in. And now I've got my completed rocker arm assembly. And this rocker arm should rock free with no difficulty. All right, I just have to do that 14, uh, 13 more times. And that's the last of my 14 little rocker arms. By the way, when you're doing something tedious and repeated like this, it's helpful to spread them out in order so you can see how many you've done and also so you can see if you've done something backwards. Uh, if they all look the same, they're a lot more likely to all be correct. In step four, we're going to begin to put together the push rods. And there are two kinds of push rods. The exhaust push rods have two holes in them, and they fit against the exhaust uh, piece, and they have a slightly different angle than the intake push rods, which are identified by the sets of three. You can see the difference in the angle right across there. One's a little taller than the other. All of those get pairs of pushrod fork ends that go across the end and are going to attach to our rocker arms. So this process that I'm going to do gets repeated 14 times before we're done. I'm going to go ahead and start with the exhaust pushrod end, move some of this out of the way so everybody can see, and let's zoom in a little closer. We're going to start with the end across here where we're simply going to apply a little glue Let's make that a lot of glue on this one. We're going to apply a lot of glue and we are going to push this into position. We can go ahead and smear it all over everything. And there is our basic end set and ready to go. Now the next part is a little more difficult because we need to line everything up. 
So there are little tiny holes on the end of the push rods and on the end of the fork ends. And those little tiny holes, you need to find something small enough that it can go into those little holes. And uh, those are going to help to line things up. So here we are. I'm going to go ahead and put a little glue on each of these ends. And then, using my pins, my, I actually have cotter pins here, but I'm not going to use them as cotter pins, they're just alignment tools. I'm going to go ahead and line everything up as well as I can line them up. Push everything nice and tight. And I'm also going to go ahead and use a pin that's the proper size to align this edge as well. And now I have completed one out of 14 of my push rods. So here we are with all 14 of the rods, and now we are going to have to stop and stain all of these. And I'm also going to stain all of the valves before I move on on step number four. So I've finished up all the staining for step number four. And the, next, the last thing I have to do is put the springs onto the valves. So each one of these valves needs to get a spring on it. And what we have to do is spread the end of the spring. So we spread it just enough that we can start to screw it onto the valve. Spread it for the next little spot. And thread it down onto the valve. The last little bit's going to get hard because it is caught again. But there we are. Our valve has a spring on it, and we are ready to do that 13 more times. And that, friends, is the completion of step number four. So now we're ready in step five to create the cam plate. Um, I've gone ahead and I've put all the parts together. Up close, how to know that you're doing this correctly. This is the exhaust cam plate, and if you look at the exhaust cam plate, you'll see the two holes on the top, the tiny hole on the bottom, and if it's setting the right direction, the lobe is going to be just to the left on the exhaust cam plate. The exhaust cam plate is the one with the gear teeth. If you pop over here to the intake cam plate, no teeth on the inside, two holes at the top, one hole at the bottom, and you'll notice that the lobe, the cam lobe, is to the right of the two holes as it sits across the top. These are all going to be sandwiched, and we can use the holes for guide pins to help us sandwich it correctly. Then once those are sandwiched on top of each other, we're going to get a pair of shoulders to help it spin a little easier, and those are going to go across that, and we're going to glue that sandwich all together, and that will be the completed cam plate. I personally find that it's easiest to spread the, the glue on the plate spoke set. So I'm going to come across here and I'm going to go ahead and spread my glue. I don't want too much glue, I don't want it to interfere with how anything works, but now my spoke set is set correctly. I'll come back and I'll get the, uh, the shoulders later. I'm going to bring this down, align everything, and set it in position. Now once I've set it in position, I'm going to go ahead and grab some alignment pins just to make sure everything stays in the proper alignment. Now we're ready to do the same thing again. the outside edge of the spokes. And we're going to set our intake cam plate across the top. Find the alignment holes, lower it down over the top. You could use more pins than I'm using. I personally have found that this is enough pins even though I gave you lots and lots to work with. Now all we've got to do is add our shoulders. And these shoulders are pretty critical, so you want to make sure that they're lined up correctly. Um, there is nothing but a visual on those. So uh, you can kind of feel. Set that in place. There's the front set of shoulders in good shape.
Here's the back set of shoulders. They're non-directional. You can spread the glue on whichever side you want to hide. And if there is any squeeze out on the inside, make sure you wipe that squeeze out down. I'm probably actually going to sand this inside board before I go any further. But I have to let the glue dry first, and then I'm going to go ahead and, just like I've done on everything else, I'm going to go ahead and stain these, uh, this part before it's ready to move on. All right, I don't know about you, but I've been looking forward to putting the case together, and it's finally time to start putting it together. Now, the uh, first layer comes in a variety of different pieces, and we are going to set this layer upside down and put all those pieces together. So they interlock, and these, piece, these puzzle joints are going to be hidden, but they interlock across here, and uh, a few of your early kits have pieces that don't come apart and interlock, but they shift a lot better this way, and so that's how most of our kits are going to be in the future. This is that first layer that we're going to put together, and you will notice that I have it upside down. And I don't mean upside down as in you can see it right side up in the camera. I mean the downside is facing downwards so that I can work on the back of this kit. We're going to dry fit this piece together first. And I need to find the rest of my pieces. Here we are. We're going to go ahead and slide in. There is our valve uh, rear case spacer. It goes next. And then after our rear case spacer, we want to go ahead and put across the uh, rear case together like this. Now, the only way we know that these are going to be put into position is going to be to pin them into place. So don't go short, uh, shy on your pins on this stage. Notice that before they're pinned into place, these fins can move around quite a ways. But after we pin them into place, they're going to be much, much more uh, locked into position. And that is the correct position. So we want to we want to get them in there and lock them into there. Um, see, if you take a look here, you'll see how much these fins have moved. Now that all of these are locked, there's only a very small amount of uh, change that's possible. And I'm going to actually address that small amount of change by um, doing the next, uh, locking the next layer in as quickly as possible on this as well. Now, before I pull these pieces off and glue them in, I'm going to go ahead and glue the cylinder rear fins onto each layer. So here's my cylinder rear fins, and we are going to glue each one of those to one of these cylinders. And uh, this is a little bit of a tedious uh, process, but, you know, we can do it. We can handle this. All right, with all these pieces glued into place, we're going to go ahead and glue on our other two pieces, beginning with the back 
spacer which we're going to glue fairly heavily. Um, beware of getting too much glue near the inside of the spacer. But there's our back spacer. And I've set mine so that the grain is going to continue the same direction that it's moving in cylinder number one. But that's uh, entirely up to a person, whoever you are, whatever you want to do. And then we're going to go ahead and glue on the rear case. And this one you can't put too much glue on. Well, you can, but it can take more glue. So I'm going to put a little more glue on it with two full rings of glue. And once again, keeping my grain in the same direction as my cylinder number one. Go ahead and slide that up into this place and pop my uh, locator pins in position. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over and I am going to add these pieces. It's wise to dry fit these layers first. You'll see this one is one, two, so it needs to fit right up here on cylinder one and cylinder number two, one, two, matching one and two. Okay, this one is one, seven. It's gonna fit up here between one and seven, just like it says it is. This one is five, six, so it goes across here. This one is six, seven, it goes right here. And we're just going to move our way across. This one is two, three. Come on now. Right there in spot two, three. This one is four, five. In spot four, five. And this one is in spot three, two. And now I've got all of these in position. Now, before I let everything dry up too much, I'm going to start gluing these into place. So I'm going to slide it off the locator pins. I, I want this whole thing to sandwich between multiple layers. And it's easiest to glue these from the back, just like what we were doing with some of the other fins. So, here we are. I don't want to put too much glue on these because I don't want any glue squeeze out uh, in the actual cylinder area. So I want to move relatively quickly as I move down into each of these thin locations. And there we are with our first piece in position. I'm going to go ahead and bring this up, put it in place, lock it down, and I am going to get some more locator pins. And this is pretty important at this point. I want those locator pins up in the corners. And that helps to make sure that everything all the way around is locked into place. I'm gonna keep going. Um, while my glue is wet, uh, I'm gonna just keep on rolling. And there's that layer. Now, the next layer we put together consists of multiple parts. 
those parts are these ones, these ones, and these ones. I can place them, in fact I'm going to dry place them across the top. There's the first one. Now that I've made it all the way around the circle and bedded all the pieces down, I'm going to come back and I'm going to put these in. And at this point, I should be able to move my locator pins from over here to help me locate the center parts. And it's just pretty much the same old, same old here. Glue it in place. Bed it down, move your pins. All right, there's all of those pieces in place. And ordinarily, the next step would be to put the valves in place. And they go in like this. We take a valve, we hold the valve in position, we pull on the spring, and we set the valve in. And now you can see the valve can move in and out, opening and closing at will. But I can't really do that yet on this particular engine because I have to stop and I have to stain all the areas on the inside of this case that are going to be closed up where I can't use the valves later on and I don't want the valves to stick into there so all the staining has to be done before I can move on. So we're back and I have stained the interior of the valve compartments which you can see across here and I've also stained the rear area across here which will be a little tough to stain after we put these layers together. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to install the valves and this is our first uh, area where we're going to get into fit between layers. This valve that I have here in my hand is one layer thick and the space for it is one layer thick as well. So we want to verify that everything slides nice and easy before we put everything together. I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to put my number one cylinder right about there so I can zoom in and show you putting in the valves. Now you can see I have the valve right across here and I'm going to need to compress the spring and slide it into position. And these valves will more or less stay in position while I do that. So I'm going to pop it in place and put it in position right across here. And you can see it tries to, to pop up if I'm not careful, but I can get it down there and force it into position. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the other valve. Pull it into position. And you can see where the valve goes right now. Get that in place, and now I'm ready with my layer that goes across the top. Before I do anything else, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this layer in its location, in its position, and I am going to put some pressure on here to verify that everything fits properly. 
if everything fits properly, while I'm pushing down on this layer, I should be able to actuate the valve. I don't know how well you can see that on the video. There, you can see that one a little bit better. While I actuate the valve, the valve should move in and out and should have no difficulty returning. If that valve is dragging, you're going to need to clean out the inside, maybe sand a little material off the valve, do whatever's necessary to make sure that that valve will actuate and return nicely like these ones do. Um, so these ones are okay, and that means I can pop this off, hopefully without losing my valves. There we go. Have this put in position. And now I'm going to go ahead and put glue across the back of this layer, just like we've done every other layer, and I'm going to pop it into position with lots of locating pins. It into place, and I am going to use some locator pins to help make sure everything is in position. Now, don't overuse locator pins. Locator pins are great for help, but they don't guarantee that everything is in proper place. So make sure that you check everything as well as use the locator pins. But there's that one, it's done, it's in place, and I'm gonna move on and I will put all the valves all the way around before we uh, finish up the engine. So I'm just gonna move from cylinder one to cylinder two and move my way all the way around the engine. There. Check position on everything, looking good. Move on to cylinder three, and you get the picture. We're just going all the way around. So that's the last of the valve layer, and at this point I need to stop and let the glue dry, and then I've got a lot of staining to do on this engine before I can progress to the next step. So I said we would go ahead and do the staining before I did anything else, and I lied. Um, I was just looking at the next step, and we may as well go ahead and fit the case spacers, the forward case spacers, before I do all of the staining. These are really easy. They just simply go one over each of the locating pins that I already have installed, and we just put a little bit of glue into each one and line them up with the case. Alignment is fairly critical on these, but there is a locating pin for every single one of these. And there we are, seven of these little fellas. And notice that they completely hide the puzzle joint that we have underneath them. Um, it's always a good sign when we can do that. There we are. Now there's one more thing I want to point out while I've got these done. I don't want to let the glue dry in such a way that I cannot remove these locator pins right now. It's nice to be able to remove your locator pins. So all the time when I added locator pins, I've always stopped and I've taken those locator pins back out before the glue dries. Because this allows me to come back and use those locator pins over and over again. And later on when I'm ready to mount this sucker on the wall when it's done, I am going to want to be able to uh, put screws or bolts through these same mounting holes. Yeah, this one does not want to leave for me, and I may have to actually uh, procure pliers to get that one out. The rest of them all coming out pretty easily. Let a little glue dry on that other one. Well, it's finally time we are going to fit the rotating assembly into the case. Um, all of the stain is dry. Everything's looking good. I still have these surfaces unstained because I'm gonna to need to glue my rocker arms into place. But everything is good in terms of uh, getting ready to mount this piece. So the biggest thing I've got to do at this point is I've got to wax this engine. This is the only time I get, the last chance I get to properly wax all of my cylinders. So if you recall, I'm using a candle, and I'm going to get in here, and I'm just going to start waxing. There's a lot of waxing to do um, before this whole thing is how it ought to be. All of these cylinder areas have got to be waxed if I want these things to spin freely and smoothly without squeaking like a duck caught. Um, and uh, so 
Round and round and round, lots and lots of wax. Don't be shy on the wax. I'm probably gonna actually wax the bottoms of this and I'm gonna wax the sides of the cylinder of the pistons. And that'll give me kind of the best of both worlds when it comes to getting all of this done. Um, I have built them without wax and they work, but they're definitely gonna squeal a little bit more without the wax. With the wax, hopefully a little less, a little smoother. So here we are. Most the way around on our wax. Last cylinder. Trying my best to get as much into there as possible. And we have our wax done. Now, as we said, we're going to wax the edges of the pistons because that's easier than the edges of the cylinders. So there's the edge of one piston, the edge of the next piston. No matter what you do, you're gonna wish you waxed more when you're done. is done on this. Now I also want to do some waxing on the back of the machine. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wax the bore across here where that shaft is going to go. I'm going to wax the bore and I'm going to choose rather than waxing the back of the case I'm just going to wax the back of this area here where everything goes. So lots of wax down in this area and I'm gonna let that wax extend all the way up and around onto this area where it's going to move. Because this is really what determines, well, this is where everything slides. And now, finally, I'm ready for the moment that we've all been waiting for, the moment where we get to fit our main systems, our rotating assembly. I'm going to swing this around so you can get a good look at it. And there she sits. Here is our master rod into piston number one. And we're just going to fit each piston one at a time as it spins round. There's everybody in their positions. And now I just have to get lucky, line everything up across there. and. There it is, the moment you, oops, going backwards. Let's go forwards, Don. Now mine's fairly stiff and that's probably the result of using all of the, uh, uh, the stain. The stain is definitely, um, it takes up space. But uh, we'll get everything rolling good across there. And we have our engine going together. All right, so I still have one more step I've got to do over here, and I have got to put an additional spacer up on this side. And this is a 16th inch spacer because I wasn't able to find 5 16th inch plywood, um, not in a true 5 16th. So if I find that, uh, these may go away in the future. You'll see it in your instructions. But as of right now, I need to put an additional 16th inch spacer to give a little play in the crankcase. Um, if there's no play in the crankcase, everything just gets too tight to really spin. So uh, we're going to go ahead and add those 16th inch spacers. Real nice and simple, doesn't take very long. Um, lots of glue and pop our 16th inch spacers in place. Now, what's next? Uh, the next thing we've got to do is start building the valve case. And on step number 10, it goes with the crankcase to valve case. I have the pieces required for step number 10, the big ones right across here, and I have pre-stained this little fella and waxed him, and this is gonna be the idler shaft for the gear. Now, um, mine is a little bit too tight, so I'm gonna actually have to go use a, um, a drill 
and just edge this hole out just a tiny bit to get this to fit. I suppose I could whittle the bottom of this pin or sand the bottom of this pin and that might be quicker and easier. Uh, but any method that you can to install that pin and then we'll be ready to mount everything. Unfortunately, I am not ready to mount everything because remember I'm doing this um, staining process and I have to stain all of these parts. All of these are going to get the light color stain because they would be the aluminum center case uh, where everything goes. And I've got to do some stain on the front surface and some stain on the back surface. Um, and rather than fit these one, two, three on top of here, I'm actually going to build these separately, come back and stain them, set this piece, and then I will have these three pieces assembled and mount them all at once. It's just a little easier to do the stain from the back before I put everything in. All right, I decided I wanted to go ahead and show you this step as well. So I have actually sanded just a little bit off on this, um, on this rod, on the, the, I believe we called it the idler shaft. And it is very, very critical that this idler shaft go all the way down below the surface of this gear. If this idler shaft sticks out, then the cam plate, which is going to spin on top of it, is going to give us problems. So you can see my idler shaft works okay. I am going to test fit just to make sure everything fits. Lots of test fitting is good. And I test fit this across here and I can see that this fits nicely. This clears quite well. And let me test, I'm going to test the cam plate as well while I'm here. This, this is my last chance to make any changes to anything. So I want to make sure that all the gears fit nicely and everything works out. When I set this here, yes, we are in perfect condition. All of the bores fit. Now, I do have to tell you, I sanded just a little bit off on one side of this and not on the other, and that's because I found that I wasn't quite perfect when I did this. Unfortunately, the laser cutter doesn't always have exactly the same kerf, so I couldn't exactly uh, know where this went. And all the little ones have worked fine, but this big one I needed to sand just a little more off of one side than the other. And that raised that gear shaft up just a little bit, and now everything fits perfectly. And when I say just a little bit, again, I sanded on one side of the shaft and not the other. It probably would have worked okay if I hadn't done that. But um, attention to detail does make a big difference. So we're going to get a little glue in there. I'm going to ram this little fella home. Wipe the glue into the shaft. Once the glue is wiped into the shaft, we're going to set this up in position there it is all the way down we don't want any squeeze out glue to be around the side or if there's squeeze out glue that's going to interfere with the action of the uh, um, the little uh, timing idler and there it sits right across there uh, we'll talk more about the timing gears when we get there but now i can go ahead and assemble the rest of this piece now this piece is pretty definite because the idler shaft goes on the bottom. This piece really doesn't matter how it goes, but if you want to be careful, go ahead and set it so that the straight grain aligns with the straight grain on the other piece. I've got this set on top right now, but I'm going to swap them as soon as I put my ring of glue around it. There we go. Got my ring of glue. And we can pop this into position. And this is not particularly critical, so how about we go with maybe three alignment pins to help everything line up. There's our alignment pins, and now we are ready for our next piece and this one is the valve case to adapter plate. This is one of my favorite pieces in the in the whole setup. Once again I'm looking for where the grain runs on this and I want the straight grain running to match the rest of this and I'm coming up with boy it's a little hard to tell which direction this went. I if it's hard to tell it can't be that bad regardless of what I do but I think I want it setting right like I'm going to go here. There we are. Yeah, I'm okay with that. So, um, 
I'm going to have to take and turn it upside down, spread the glue on top of it. And we'll put just a little drop of glue on each of these little pieces. These are there to keep the timing ends from dipping down too low and make sure that our, uh, our valve spacers don't end up wrong. And now we are ready. Once again, using our alignment pins. Pop that into place. Lots of downwards pressure. And this is our crankcase to valve case adapter area. I am going to allow this glue to dry and then I'm going to go ahead and do all my staining on this before I come back and set it onto the engine. Um, and this is definitely one of the more critical places because I want to be able to get the back of this thing. There we are, now you can see it. I gotta get everything, all the stain done in the back as well as in the front if I'm gonna get a professionally uh, done job. It doesn't come apart easily. Uh, it's not like a mechanical device that where you can unbolt it and bolt it back together again. Unless I suppose you wanted to build it that way. If you wanted to, you could um, put quarter inch bolts through all of this on the crankcase and then you wouldn't have uh, quite so much of a one shot sort of mentality when it came to doing this and you could pull it apart and show everybody the, uh, the logo inside. That's what you want to show them, right? The, the, my logo? Thank you. If you look really close, you'll see that one has a little more of the hole covered up on the end. The other one has got a partial hole. And the one that's covered up on the end is the exhaust layer. The one that's open on the edge is the intake layer. And the exhaust layer goes down first. You're definitely going to want alignment pins as you go about putting these things into position. So we're going to set our alignment pins. One, two, three, four, five, six, all seven of the alignment pins in this area, and we are going to go after our layers. Again, beginning with the side that has the complete hole, that is the exhaust layer. We're gonna put the exhaust layer down, little glue on the back, and we're gonna put all seven of these into position. There's the first one, and I'm going to go ahead and pop one more uh, guide pin into that spot. Here's our next one. You may ask yourself, why are these so broken up? And uh, why didn't he just build this in one layer like he did everything else? Well, the reason is these are going to allow, in this slot, this is going to allow the uh, intake valve and the exhaust valve to make contact with the proper plate. So that's why we put the layers together the way that we do. Alright, here's the last one. And you're going to notice there was a little shifting and I put some C-clamps on this model um, while I was off camera because I decided I wanted to make sure that these um, closed up really good and firm. This is the only place that I've used C-clamps on this model. The rest of it I've just gone ahead and Put together. If you use clamps, of course, it will make everything a lot better. Um, that's just the nature of putting things in place. Now, here's our next layer, and this layer is called the um, valve guide separator ring. And that valve guide separator ring needs to get glued on top of here. So we're going to put our glue down all the way around. And I'm trying not to allow enough glue, uh, glue to get in place where these locator pins are, because I want to remove these locator pins myself. You can leave them in if you want to, but I personally like to remove most of the locator uh, pins. Uh, certainly a personal preference item, and that's my personal preference. So there we go. 
now we're ready for the ring and remember the grain direction we want to pay attention to our grain direction our grain is running this direction on the ring here we are grain runs this direction on the ring so I'm going to line that up with cylinder number one and we are going to ease this into position over 14 locator pins and that's going to take a little bit of um, doing to get it to come down but I think we're gonna manage we'll see about that here we go I suppose we could take those pins out one at a time but shoot is more of a challenge this way my locator pins and there is our separator ring in position and now we are ready for that next layer which is our uh, intake valve layer now the intake valve layer runs the opposite direction from the exhaust valve layer because these don't these uh, need to be in a separate location so uh, here we are, this is the intake layer, and the exhaust layer, you remember, laid the other direction. So we're just going to glue these in place and resume the use of our locator pins. Once again, make sure you're on the right side while you're doing your glue. There he is. There he is. We're going to pop him in position and pop our locator pins in place. There's one pin. There's the next pin. And we repeat and do that seven more times. Glue. Position. Pin. Pop. And you can see the opening for our intake valve push rod form right across here. Okay, that finishes up the construction of our case. Alright, so here you see the number one piston. And the number one piston is as high in the cylinder as it can possibly go. That's called top dead center, uh, where it's just as high as it will go. Now there is a way of uh, setting it off, but we are going to determine the timing based on wherever it is. So wherever it is, that's top dead center, all the way at the top. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to put this timing gear onto our crankshaft. And this dot needs to be as far down as it can go, while this piston is as far up as it can go. And that's what's going to determine the timing. Now, this is the single most difficult step in the entire assembly of this engine, because we need to glue this, pist uh, this um, ring, this gear, onto this shaft without gluing it to the case below. This is where our friend wax paper comes in handy. We're going to use a little wax paper to help us just to fit around the shaft here so that it will help me not to glue things to the base. I promise you that wax paper is not perfect and it will not do everything for us. It is an aid. It is not a fail-safe. So we're going to take that wax paper. I'm going to make a couple more of them. This time I'm actually going to just press it down on that shaft so I can see the exact right curve and I'm going to leave just a tiny little flange on my wax paper and I'm going to put about three to four of these little sheets of wax paper around here to try and help me not make a mess of putting this um, gear. I'm going to get down here and I'm going to put just a few dots of glue right onto the edge of my shaft. Just a few little dots of glue. Not a lot, um, but it does need to be fairly firm. So we definitely have to put the glue in. Um, this is not magic. It has to have something to hold it. Okay, so I've got my little dots of glue around the edge. I'm going to bring my 
ring into place and I'm going to very slowly smooth it, smooch it back and forth as I go down. And I'm actually pretty happy with how that looks. My wax paper is as tight as I can keep it. My line, my dot, is exactly aligned with the idler gear while I'm at the top dead center position. And just to verify, I'm going to take my, not my crank gear, but my idler gear, and I'm going to set it in place. And if you look, you can see that my dot on the idler gear aligns with my dot on the crank gear. Everything is as it should be. I'm going to put a little more glue across here. And I have to be really cautious about adding more glue because any glue is going to have to come off in order for my um, in order for my uh, cam shaft to be able to spin across the top. So I'm going to kind of work that glue down into the slot. Now, I have uh, a couple of people who put these together who recommend that you actually insert a keyway into here and help that happen. They've had the, the thing break on them. And if you want to go ahead and do that, that's not a bad idea at all. Maybe drill a slight angled hole and put a small key into it. Anything that will keep that thing from falling down in place would be a good idea. I'm going to just go ahead and leave it and leave it to dry right like this. And what I like to do is while it's drying, every um, few minutes I'll, I'm going to come back and I'm just going to slightly turn things just to make sure that it doesn't get locked in. I'm not dry enough yet for that to work. So we're going to put everything back into position. And I'll come back several times over the next few uh, minutes. Over the next half hour, I'll turn it three, four, five times. Just enough to make sure that nothing gets locked in. Everything is able to spin nicely and freely. And then we'll be ready to finish up our uh, crank case, or our, our valve case. While I'm talking about doing all of that on the valve case, this is the cover to the valve case. And I'm going to go ahead, just like I did before, while, while we're off camera, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stain the back of the cover for the valve case um, just to have everything nice and ready to put together. Um, I'll probably go ahead and glue the piece to the top because that's what the next scene, the next uh, instruction is going to call for. But again, we'll do that off camera. You remember all that wax paper we put in so carefully? Uh, we're going to very equally carefully pop that wax paper out getting a little bit of glue sticking on it. Uh, it's been a while. Now we're going to make our check. And we have, let's get that wax paper out of there. I don't like it in there. I'm gonna have to go for the big guns here, guys. Gonna go for the Swiss Army knife and the little reamer on the end. Pop that little bit of wax paper out of there. Come on, you sucker. Our engine spins pretty freely for an engine of this size. We're going to go back to top dead center. And I'm going to replace the timing rod, or the timing gear. And I am going to place it so that the timing mark aligns with the timing gear. So here we can see the timing mark on the idler gear. And here we can see the timing gear on the crank gear. And those have to line up just like they line up in the manual. I'm going to dry fit my cam plate uh, just so that I can watch it spin round and round because I like seeing things move. So the cam plate should go onto the shaft and here you can see the timing mark that lines up across here. I've got my cam plate in position and I should be able to see the cam plate move as the cam plate ought to move. Now it's not going to stay in position right now because I still have to build all of the valve lifters into the case and then we'll fit everything on a slightly more permanent basis. Our next step is going to be to fill the valve case and the first thing we need to do is we need pins that are cut to the right length for our pivot pins on our valve lifters. Um, now if this is a single size model, this pin should be cut to about five layers thick. Well, it's actually five layers thick regardless. It's just five eighths or five quarters, depending on which thickness of model you've got. 
those pins are permanently going to become a part of this particular model. So it doesn't hurt if you go ahead and actually glue these in from the back. You can wait and glue these in from the front. It's kind of up to you. But I'm going to glue mine in at the back because that way I don't have to worry about what to do with the glue at the end. So these come down like this. We place them in, in a position and then we tuck them up between the individual guides. We're going to start with the longer side. The longer side is the side that is used for the uh, exhaust. And we're going to go ahead and start by tucking the uh, exhaust ones in. Tuck them in, put them between the... There's our exhaust lifters in place. After our exhaust lifters are in place, now, one a, a little word of caution on these, sometimes these are a little bit tight, and if they're a little bit tight, this one's tight right here. Okay, this is loose, it moves easily, moves easily, moves fine. This one's tight, moves easily, moves easily, tight. I'm actually gonna sand just a tiny bit of material off the back of these so that they can move easily. And you can see right where that material needs to be removed, right in the center. I'm going to come back over here to my sander and I'm going to take just a tiny little piece of material off the back because I want these things to move freely. I want them to move up and down. There's not a lot of force on my um, machine. All right, so you can see I've sanded just a tiny bit of material from back behind there. And now when I pop these into position, they move easily just like the rest of them do. And that is going, little things like that will pay huge dividends when you go to make this thing spin. The next thing I've got is a tiny little valve arm spacer. And each of these pieces gets a valve arm spacer. Now this is actually optional on the valve arm spacer. Earlier versions of the engine relied on those, these a lot more heavily than the modern one does, um, than the current one, I should say. So, but I'm just gonna go ahead and put them in there because they're included and it doesn't take very long. And now we're ready to go ahead with the um, intake valve lifters. And on our intake valve lifters, we're just going to do the same thing. They're going to line up. you notice that I pre-stained them. They're going to line up. We're going to hold everything in position. We're just going to go around, all the way around, making sure that everything is set. And now that our spacers are in place, we are ready to put the cam plate in. Now just like on everything else we've done, when it's time to put the plate in, the gear goes in the back, the plate sits across here, this is our chance to wax everything. So I'm going to wax the bore of the cam plate. As much wax as I can get on the bore of the cam plate, and I'm going to wax the shoulders of the cam plate, both on the front and on the back. And that should just help the cam plate to spin a lot more smoothly as it's time for it to do its job. So wax on the front and on the back of the cam plate. Knock off any extra wax that I see. And now we are going to set our cam plate. Now, just like we set everything else, the timing has to be perfect. This dot has to line up with this dot like I showed you before. And our timing dots have to line up. I'm going to move around here and get a better view of our timing dots in just a second so that everybody can see all of that. But there we are in position with our dots all aligned everywhere that we look. All right, so now it's time to make like a private eye and close this case. Unfortunately, just like the rear case needed spacers, our front case needs spacers as well. So I've got these thin 1 16th inch spacers to give us a little room to move and breathe inside this case. And these spacers are gonna need to be glued into position and then the um, lid will need to be glued onto the case.
Now once the case spacers are in place, I'm ready to put the front on the case. And that's that front we already prepared, already stained, and got everything ready. Now it doesn't matter which direction we put this, but I like the green to run straight up and down, so I'm going to put it right in here. But just like the private eye said, case closed. Now it's time to put on the rocker arm assemblies. Putting on the rocker arm assemblies is pretty simple. We're simply going to pop our locator pins into position. Now you can either put them in position on top the engine like this, and then position the rocker arm assembly, or you can actually position them the opposite direction. You can put the, rocker, the uh, locator pins on the bottom of the rocker arm assembly and then position them in place on the engine. Whichever way is your preference, that's the way that you ought to do it because it really doesn't make that much difference uh, in terms of the final result. I'm going to do it this direction and I'm just simply going to add the glue and then put that in place. So here you can see my rocker arm on my locator pins and I'm going to come back over here, add a little bit of glue along the area that I deliberately did not stain. And I'm going to put in my rocker arm assembly. Now notice as I put in my rocker arm assembly, I want to make sure that the rocker arm is in the right position. There it is. Located and in position. Now what you want to do is avoid getting it down like this, make sure that the rocker arm is up in the proper location. There we are, two rocker arms assembled, and you can see that the valve does work as it ought to work, and everything is good and right with our cylinder head. I'm going to go ahead and finish out the rest of this engine, but then we'll be back. And now, we have gone ahead and finished out our rocker arms. Now one of the last things we need to do uh, before we finish off the engine, one of the finishing touches is the prop flange. And the prop flange, I'm going to put two rings over it, one on the front and one on the back, and then I'm going to put these dowel pins into it to make it look like a reasonably realistic uh, piece. So, assembling the prop flange is pretty simple, if we know how to open our glue bottle. Assembling the prop flange is pretty simple. We just put a ring of glue around one piece, line it up, put a ring of glue around the other piece, Line it up. And if I wasn't trying to do this coloration, all I'd do is I would then glue my six dowel pins, which I've already colored back at the early stages. I've colored nice and black. And I'd pop those, glue them into place, and I would be done with my prop flange. But because I am doing all the coloration that I'm going to do, I'm going to have to varnish this into my darker, my middle gray color. So So the dowel pins are going to go in and they are going to sit um, just slightly below the surface across here. Um, this is not particularly important, but it is uh, how I choose to do it and how I've drawn it in the uh, diagrams as well. We're going to put just a little bit of glue up inside there, not quite that much glued on. All right, we'll put a little glue up inside and then we will get that dowel pin.
And there she is. So if you take a look, you can see, you remember I put that bevel on the end of the dowel pin and I got the beveled part just sitting just a tiny bit below the edge. And that looks a lot like what the real part actually looks like on an aircraft. Um, so whether or not you choose to go with that convention is totally up to you. But that's how I like my parts to look. glue in there and we'll go with our next dowel pin and we're just going to work pin to pin six times shoot six times is nothing after you've been doing 28 times right I did want to show you the final position of how these pieces have just a slight just a slight presence on the back side as well as mainly on the front side so now that we've built the hub, we are ready for our one of our final steps, and that's to install the hub on the shaft. Now what we want to do to install the hub on the shaft, we want to put glue inside the bore on the shaft. And we want to wipe that glue all the way around inside the bore uh, so that it's going to stick nice and firm. And I've concentrated the glue on the back side of the bore because it, of course, will get pushed forward as we start to set the glue. Uh, set the uh, shaft down onto the uh, main, set the hub down onto the main shaft. So here we are, and because this is important enough, we want to make sure that it doesn't come off. I'm going to, uh, I think I can get a little more glue into that than I did. I'm going to go back and I'm going to add some more glue. We need lots of glue on this. Uh, we do not want this prop hub coming off. You know, then the propeller would come flying off the airplane and that would be bad news. We don't want any accidents occurring on our fake make-believe aircraft. So here we are. We're going to go ahead and try our best to get this hub down into position. And we want it to be nice and level. We're going to wipe off any excess glue that I have here. Um, and we have set our hub. We are very, very rapidly twor uh, cruising towards getting completely done with our engine, and I am happy with that. I'm going to go ahead and pop these pins out of the way because there's no reason for them to stay in there. And the only thing we have left to do to finish this up is to add our push rods. But that'll be the next step after I wait for all the glue to dry, and um, that will be the last thing that I have to do on this engine besides lots and lots of touch-up stain. Well, here we are, and this may be the last session for actually assembling the engine. I know I'm going to have to spend a little more time staining and everything, but uh, hopefully we can finish up the engine. Uh, for me, this has been almost a two-week process because I have to keep waiting for the stain to dry before I can go in and do anything else. But uh, I'm pretty excited about this. All we have left is the last step, which is installing the push rods, and then I'm going to take this thing home and I'm going to stain and spend a lot more time. All right, I'm going to refresh your memory that there are two kinds of push rods. There's our exhaust kind of push rod with two little mortises, and our intake kind of push rod with three little mortises. And the intake one goes in the top location, and it should go in and it should move smoothly back and forth. And if it doesn't move smoothly back and forth, you're going to need to sand a little bit off the back surface to make sure that it does move smoothly back and forth. And we're going to do the same thing. The exhaust one goes in the other, the lower slot, and it should also move smoothly back and forth without any difficulty. And again, if it doesn't move smoothly back and forth, make sure that you sand a little material off. Our uh, push rods should join smoothly onto the rocker arms and they should be able to be pinned into position and if that doesn't occur and if this doesn't move smoothly you're going to need to sand material off of that to make sure that all of that occurs smoothly and when we're done we should be able to push on the end of our valve train and have our valve move you may ask yourself the question what do i mean by moving smoothly well one good way to tell is can the rocker arm support itself like this if it can this one's right on the edge. This one is not really smooth enough, so I'm going to need to sand a little material off on that edge. I can pop this little rocker pin out at this point, and I can still go ahead and sand a little material off so that it works. Um, 
when it comes to going inside, it should easily fall under its own weight if I were to stand, set the engine straight up into its position. This needs to move pretty smoothly. Um, where we need to wax is right on the back side of the rocker arm itself where it contacts the valve. That's where any waxing needs to be done. So right there, that does make a pretty big difference on its ability to move. I'm going to go ahead and pin this rocker arm into position one more time. And when we're done, we should have the valve moving nicely and easily um, across when the rocker arm activates or when, the, uh, when we push on the, the push rod. There's the entire valve train moving right now. So I've gone ahead, like I said, and I sanded a little bit off the back of these. I just did them all because I decided it was easier that way than trying to sort one at a time. But uh, you can do them one at a time. Um, this is how I'm going to clean out the insides. I've got a file, and if you were using the small kit, you could use an Embry board. And I'm just going to uh, simply put a few strokes across here with the file. That'll even things up really nice if it tends to get caught inside there. And I have my exhaust push rod ready to go. Well, almost ready to go because I am going to wax the contact surface of the exhaust push rod. And I'm going to go ahead and wax this as well because, you know, wax makes everything run a little bit smoother. So here's my exhaust push rod, which is my lower of my two push rods. Goes in and moves really nice and easily now. Um, Remember we talked about how that would go. Now you can see it easily falls. Everything is in good shape. I'm going to ease that thing up into position and I am going to pop my little rod or my little connector right across there. Now you could glue this. I'm going to choose not to glue this. Instead of gluing it, I'm just going to put a little stain on it and that's going to hold it in place. But there is our completed rod. And when I take this and I turn it, in the correct counterclockwise direction, it should now, there we are, we see it activating. You can see everything moving. And there is our first valve actuation across here. And we should be just about ready, and here we come again. There's our next valve actuation. Everything is working as it should. Now we're going to go ahead and do the same to an intake valve. The intake valve has three lobes on it. We're going to wax the rounded lifting surface. We're going to wax the back face. We're going to wax the front face. We are going to check and see whether or not it stays. Oh, that's much too tight. Take a look right across there. Definitely one that we're going to need to smooth out the inside. So I've got my file sitting right here couple of strokes across that with the file, a couple of strokes on the other side, blow it off, and let's see how we're doing now. Um, still a little tight, not quite as tight as we were. We want to get it right. This is our chance to do it. So, here we are. Let's see how we're doing now. Still a little bit on the tight side. Maybe that we have some little nubbins through the uh, stain on here. So we'll try and take a little off of this side as well to make everything fit nice and easy. There we are. That's what we want to see. So, place the valve in the, the uh, push rod into position. I'm going to actually move this engine just a little bit because I want that push rod to be in the closed position. Or that valve to be in the closed position while I set the push rod in place. There is our connecting pin. There's our intake valve. Um, I'm turning the engine backwards and yes, both valves open and both valves shut. Now, sometimes, if you put this together, you may find that one of the valves doesn't have quite enough clearance. If that's the case, you'd sand a little bit off of the valve lifter. Um, but it should be good just the way that it's set up. And we'll go ahead and call it good. 
All right, and we have seven more cylinders to do, and this engine is going to be done all except for the stain. So folks, we have built our single style model. It goes together the same way as our double style model. And here's the double style model, very carefully assembled. And I still have just a little bit of touching up to do on the stain before. I'm gonna mount this on an easel and then I'll show you how it all works. Um, but I'm pretty pumped about this. I gotta turn it just a little bit. Yes, it turns. And as we turn it a little more, it should get easier and easier to turn. Um, and I'll come back and I'll demonstrate this on video here again in just a second. So after about two weeks of work, lots and lots of stain, lots and lots of hours, we have our completed engine. I'm pretty pleased with it. I hope yours goes as well as this one has.